Awesome. Well, we have reached the point where my uh, anxiousness at sitting here in silence uh, overcomes my uh, uh, desire to make sure that uh, we're uh, just waiting for folks to waiting for folks to come. So I'm going to get us started. Um, uh, and um, thank you so much to everyone for joining us. Thank you so much um, to Corica and Hafet. Um, and to our amazing interpreters, uh, Nora and Shannon and uh, Nancy, our uh, uh, cart captioner. Um, so this is the goal of this is just an informal conversation about sort of the first year of IFRA featuring two of our fantastic fellows, Corica and Hafet. Um, and I'd love to just sort of like let them talk a little bit about kind of their backgrounds, like where did they go? Where did they go to law school? What brought them there? Um, and sort of what are the kinds of things that they're interested in um, as a way of sort of teeing up um, some of the conversations that we might have about the First Amendment space more generally and about their time at IFRA. So maybe um, Karika will start with you if that's okay and then go to Hafet. Yeah, that's fine. Um, hi everyone, uh, I'm Karika. I'm a third year law student. I originally started at the University of Washington in Seattle, um, and then I transferred my second year to Cornell, so that's where I'm currently at. Um, what brought me to law school? I've actually had to answer this like quite a bit since I've been um, like a, a teaching assistant for this law class. And so I've had a lot of undergrads ask like, why are you in law school? Because they're interested. Um, but basically, I, I pretty much always knew I wanted to go to law school, like looking at lawyer movies. I was like, oh, yeah, this is what I want to do. Um, but I took three years off and I worked at a nonprofit in Seattle in the technology industry. And I was like, oh, I actually really like technology. Like, I wonder if I could do something um, around that area. Um, and so, yeah, ended up going to law school and figuring out that I wanted to do something around um, technology surveillance. Um, and then I did the EFRA program and I was like, oh yeah, there's connections between First Amendment and technology surveillance. And I was like, yeah, so that's what I wanna do. Awesome, um, thank you, Karika. Uh, quick question before we move on to Hafet. Top, the top movie that inspired you to go to law school when you saw the lawyers in the in the movies. <laughs> Legally Blonde is a perfectly acceptable answer. In fact, that's my yeah. answer. Um, so, but yeah. I, I want to I want to provide you the opportunity to share if you want. Yeah, Legally I think Legally Blonde is probably that's like top of the list for most people. <laughs> Surprisingly realistic. Um, yeah. Uh, Fantastic. Awesome. All right. Hafet, um, do you mind introduce, basically introducing yourself, sharing a little bit about your background um, and what brought you to sort of law school? Hi, my, hi to everyone. My name is Jafet. I'm 24 years old. Um, um, what um, brought me to, to law school? That's a hard question. <laughs> but I, I really think it was this interest uh, for uh, I remember at first I have an interest in employment law. So, and, and labor law and all this. And, and I think that, that like get me into uh, just considering law school. Um, currently I am doing a JD MBA program at the University of Puerto Rico and the graduate school of business administration. Um, that's uh, what I've been doing for this years. Awesome. Thank you. Um, so I want to sort of open up with a pretty broad question, which, you know, is, uh, and Karika, you talked a little bit about this already, but like, you know, the First Amendment space is super, super broad, even if we only talk about the bits of it that are freedom of expression, you know, we ignore the other four parts of the First Amendment. I totally know how many, how many rights there are in the First Amendment. Um, uh, so what kind of work interests you in this space? Like what is, what is some stuff you're excited about or, or interested in? Um, and Hafet, I'll let you go first and then uh, Karika. And I also don't need to play traffic cop every time. I just figure it's less awkward um, if uh, I'm saying one person than the other than both of you just sitting there and being like, who's going first, so. <laughs> well, I think um, I was I working related to First Amendment 
I always like I like intellectual property, so I, I like to combine a copyright and trademark law with freedom of expression. Also, this year I've been working a lot with public records and information pro uh, policies related uh, to privacy law in Puerto Rico, because there's like there's not a lot of content in in, in Spanish that is related to this topic. Um. Also, I also worked with slap suits. Uh, and here, people at some point like are afraid of dealing with slap suit, almost with, because of the aspect of because they are in English and they speak Spanish, so they at some point like get afraid of dealing with this. Quick follow up question: There um, is are there particular topics where folks are getting hit with? Um, so SLAP, for those folks who don't know, stands for Strategic Lawsuit Against Public Participation. Um, are there particular topics or areas where folks are getting hit with like uh, these legal threats um, and are, that, that you've seen? Yeah, political speech. Like, it, it seems to be the most common one. And people just, uh, they <laughs> exercise their freedom of expression and they just get slapped with a takedown or, or, or anything that, that defamation, libel, and it's not funny. Yeah, fair. <laughs> uh, awesome. Karika, do you want to talk a little bit about stuff that's uh, interesting to you in the First Amendment space? Yeah, um, so like I said, I've, I've always known I wanted to do things around technology surveillance, particularly around um, the ways in which government uses surveillance um, and just how to stop that from happening. Um, and I started to realize that there are some connections between the First Amendment and government surveillance. Um, a few particular things as journalists being surveilled um, and having to choose what stories they can and can't cover. Um, inmates are surveilled um, in prisons and they have to be careful about what they say. Um, you have Muslim communities um, having their phone lines tapped or um, informants uh, within their communities and they um, have spoken about how they have to be careful about what they say um, so that people don't suspect them of being a terrorist. Um, and so I've just, have developed this interest around um, the ways in which surveillance harms First Amendment rights, where it, even like everyday people, um, like if you're Googling something, like everyone has that moment where they're like, oh, I wonder if I'm on a watch list now because <laughs> I just Googled this. Um, and so I'm just interested um, in countering that so that people feel like they can say what they want to say, that they can protest um, different government actions without fear of being watched and what happens um, after that. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah, I feel like, you know, the when you're about to Google for something like type it, feel, I feel like there's a moment where I'm like, should I type in first? Like, I'm an attorney enter, this is something I am Googling for information about research, enter, actually Google whatever the thing is. Um, so, and I feel like if I'm doing that, then probably there are other people who are doing that as well. Um, so, you know, how to, how to turn surveillance into a cute joke about what Google monitoring our searches. Um, okay, uh, um, thank you both for sharing those thoughts. Um, so uh, as part of the if for a program, y'all both got to spend some time at a clinic um, over the summer. Um, Hafet, we had the, the great pleasure of having you with us at the Cyber Law Clinic. Um, and then Karika, you were at uh, the Berkeley, I always forget if it's the Samuelson Glushko or the Glushko Samuelson, I think it's Samuelson Glushko uh, uh, Clinic uh, at Berkeley Law School. Uh, um, and uh, I'd love to hear y'all sort of reflect on your time at the at those clinics, and you know, maybe maybe from a bias standpoint, I'd love to hear about sort of a your best memory or what a highlight of it. Um, although general general reflections would also be welcome. Um, 
So uh, yeah, I'm happy to have whichever one of you uh, who wants to go first, go first. I think um, <laughs> I could start with that one. I think it, it was a great experience. Like uh, it, they were a great team working around great people that are all about uh, teamwork, respect. And they have this different perspective that make you at some point like change the way you think and respond to things. So I think that was great. I have uh, a, a great variety of works also. And I think for a curious thing that happened, I remember that as one of my goals, I, will, I, I said that I would like to be better at public speaking. <laughs> and they get me in a, a, a client a meeting with a client. And it's your turn, Jafet. You have to do that, that the meeting. <laughs> uh, I'm afraid, I don't know if I can handle this, but it, everything, uh, they, we did it great, so these are bye. <laughs> I feel obliged to say as a clinician that I hope you were given warning that that was going to happen. Like, it, no, I, ha okay. I got a warning. I got a warning. <laughs> <laughs> but still, <laughs> yeah, still, I feel like you never forget your first the first time. It's like your job to talk in the client meeting. Um, so awesome! Thank you. Um, yeah, I really, really enjoyed my time at the Samuelson um, clinic. Um, I told my IFRA people that like it was the first time that I ever felt like I belonged um, in a legal space. Um, and so I'm just like so appreciative of it. Um, they like my team was just so supportive, um, just like really reaffirming. Like, I feel like you don't get a lot of feedback um, in legal spaces. And so it was just like really nice to feel like, oh yeah, like I'm on the right track. I'm doing what I'm supposed, supposed to be doing. Um, and they also just like really cared a lot about making sure I got projects I was interested in. Um, and so they originally gave me like a very like, uh, just like, focus solely on like First Amendment issues project. And then when they heard I was also kind of interested in government surveillance and stuff, they were like, okay, let's put you on this project, which is more geared towards government surveillance and First Amendment. And so they cared a lot about making sure that I had a good experience. Um, and something scary, but very good for me that happened was we would have uh, meetings once a week with the whole team and everyone had to go around and say what project they were working on and they had to explain the project and explain where they were at in the process. And ironically, I've never had to do that at any of my internships. <laughs> and so I had to like I felt like I just built a lot of skills, like understanding what I was doing and how to explain that to someone else. And it also helped me understand my project better, weirdly enough. Um, so I guess like Hafet, like I was also kind of building like public speaking um, skills. So, yeah. Amazing. Uh, thank you. Um, so Hafet, a specific question for you. Um, so I know uh, that one of the projects you got to work on over the summer was on the uh, DMCA, the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, um, and takedowns brought under the DMCA against journalists in Mexico. Um, and I'd love to hear you talk a little bit about that project generally and your sort of your role in it, especially sort of given uh, the bilingual nature of your re uh, legal practice and how that sort of played into your success in doing that work. Well, um, this project has had uh, a special importance uh, for me because I have, I have seen this uh, type of attack like personally. So, and they have been a lot of abuses like this in Latin America when they take advantage of, of people and journalists. And, but we were essentially working on a guide uh, to educate journalists and regular users uh, of the internet 
from, from Mexico, Latin American um, countries on how to respond to fraudulent DMCA takedown notices that at some point or some, a lot of cases, they were used as a weapon to silence the journalists, that it's definitely not the purpose of the DMCA takedown, that it's supposed to be for copyright infringement. So I didn't, at some point, I learned a lot during this work because I did know about the DMCA takedown notices, the DMCA takedown process, but I didn't know that it was so common that they use this, like they misuse it, like they use it at some wrong point. And I learned about it a lot. I am actually, I actually re, uh, wrote another academic article about it for a class. So I really engage with the topic and I'm willing to help more people in that community with it. Amazing. I didn't know you'd written more about it. That's so cool. And I'm so, so glad to hear that. Um, uh, yeah, and um, that project, project is public. The guide, I think, came out a couple of weeks ago. So y'all can yeah, go it, check it out. Um, yeah, it, it came like, like one week ago in Mexico and, and also in Spanish for Spanish speakers. That's awesome. That's so cool. And I know that it was uh, when we saw that project, when Jess, Jess, uh, Jessica Feld, my colleague, um, said, oh, we have this project. I was like, I have the perfect person for this. So it's so awesome to have seen it come to, um, come to fruition. Um, um, Krika, so specific question for you, and I'm going a little bit off the script here. So, you know, we, feel free to not answer it if you don't want. Um, but I actually had the pleasure of also working with you a little bit on um, some work you did for the Gender Justice Clinic at Cornell um, around sort of FOSTA and uh, speech, uh, so F-O-S-T-A, FOSTA, which is the Fighting Online Sex Trafficking Act. I always forget exactly what it stands for, um, of 2018. Um, and I'd love to hear you talk a little bit about sort of how, like, one of the things, Creek, I really admire about you is the many ways in which I think that you're bringing like your specific interests and the, the intersection with first uh, the First Amendment about how that project intersected with the First Amendment and how like how uh, you ended up being involved in and writing part of the FOSTA in legal context guide. Yeah. Um, so. Yeah, I've been in quite a bit of clinics uh, during my time uh, in law school. Um, so I've done four, the Gender Justice Clinic, um, Movement Lawyering, um, Criminal Defense, and then my time at um, the Sam Wilson Clinic. And yeah, I think all of them, except maybe Criminal Defense, dealt with First Amendment and government surveillance issues. Um, so with the Gender Justice Clinic, um, like Kendra said, I worked on writing a, a, a document explaining um, FOSTA and how um, it was originally said that it would um, prevent sex trafficking, but that's not actually what it's been doing. It's had a lot of harm. Um, placed on sex workers. Um, and the connection to that with First Amendment is that um, sex workers can no longer um, chat online. Like they used to have different websites um, where they could share resources. Um, they could vet their clients and make sure um, that this was a legit person, that this person wouldn't harm them. Um, they could advertise online, but with FOSTA, it's pretty much taken that away um, because companies are scared that that um, the government will go after them for allowing that content on their website. Sorry, I'm trying to explain this without like diving into the weeds of things. Um, but obviously there's a connection because uh, sex workers can no longer use their First Amendment rights. They can't communicate. It's placing them in danger um, over yeah, government surveillance, basically. Um, and I also did the movement lawyering clinic um, this semester. Um, and we got to pick which organizations we wanted to work with. 
Um, and I worked with Palestine Legal and Muslim Justice League, which are two amazing organizations. Um, and ironically, I also got to work on First Amendment issues. Um, I particularly chose those because they dealt with First Amendment and government surveillance. Um, and yeah, I think like my time at IFRA, uh, like before I was in IFRA, I didn't know for sure if I wanted to go into the First Amendment space. And then having done IFRA and worked with the St. Wilson Clinic, I was like, okay, yeah, this is what I want to do. And so, um, yeah, I've been like really lucky to have this experience and know that this is what I want to do because this was an easy way to get into the First Amendment field. Sorry, I feel like I'm just ranting now. No, I mean, <laughs> I am going to eat up with a spoon, put on our promotional posters, you know, post excerpts from uh, that. So thank you. Um, and I didn't know that you'd done work with uh, the Muslim Justice League through the Movement Lawyering Clinic. That's so, so cool. Um, I Now I'm, I'm jealous of Cornell's Movement Lawyering Clinic. Um, it's really cool. Um, yeah. But yeah, I, and you know, as always, thank you for the thank you for the kind words about Ifra. Um, so I think you know the next thing I wanted to just ask about is you know in addition to the clinic, uh, your clinical a clinical placement over the summer, um, y'all got to uh, participate in a seminar with me, um, which was a highlight of the summer. Every every week at Wednesday at noon, um, we all got to hang out, um, and. Uh, I'd love to hear if you have anything that stands out from, or like this particular moments from the seminar that uh, you you remember. Um, and I'm absolutely not gonna be offended if you talk about all of our incredible guest speakers, um, which were for me very much highlights. Um, but yeah, I'd love to hear sort of you think if, if there were particular things there that changed how you thought or stand out to you. I can go. If that's go, right. go, very good. Okay. Um, so I particularly remember um, we had a guest speaker, um, Dr. April Williams, um, and she came in to speak to us about workspaces, um, how we present ourselves, and what to do when your workplace becomes toxic. Um, and I worked before law school. So I, like I said, I worked for three years at a nonprofit, um, but I still feel like I have a hard time navigating workspaces. And so that was just like, so useful for me. And one of the things she spoke about is how like on interviews, she doesn't feel the need to um, like change her appearance. And I think, um, for black people, that's something we often feel the need to do. And so it was just like, I don't know, very nice hearing her say that because I was already thinking about how I wanted to present myself um, in interviews around this time since I'm interviewing for full-time jobs. And um, she was just like re very reaffirming. She was like, no, like you should feel like very free to just express yourself physically however you want to because you're going to do that on the job um, which makes a lot of sense um, but I don't know it just made me feel more confident in myself um, and that's why I have my hair how I have it right now and it's not straight and it's how I want it um, but yeah it was just very like reaffirming that you don't have to change yourself that you can go to interviews as yourself um, and also how to deal with workplaces when they become toxic, like here are all the steps you can take, but at some point it may become so toxic that, um, you have to leave. And that's also nice to hear someone say like, yeah, sometimes you do have to leave. Like there's nothing else you can do. Cause I feel like for me, I feel like I have to like fight and I'd have to like make it work. And sometimes you just can't. Um, so I don't know, I really enjoyed that talk a lot. Thank you. Um, 
yeah, he's, Dr. Dr. Williams is continually an inspiration inspiration to me. So I was grateful that y'all got to got to hear hear from her. Um, Hafet, do you have a moment that you would like to share? Yeah, I have. Uh, actually, I remember too that I, I really liked a lot. It was uh, when we speak about or have a conversation about qualified immunity and its implications for First Amendment rights. Because it was in this moment when uh, the disease of uh, the start of Black Lives Matter movement of, of all the things that happened. But we, we they were also having some movements here in Puerto Rico and I, I, they were like specifically relevant for an article that I was working in. So that was really great. And also I remember I think it was attorney, uh, was Remy Green. He, he speak a, a, about uh, Straka versus LGBTCC center, which was a community center uh, in New York. And it was a slap suit, if I don't remember well, but it was a cyberbullying, defamation, discrimination, and breach of contract claims. Leave it right there, but. <laughs> Um, I think they were specifically relevant for me, and I really learned a lot about them. Yeah, it was, I think it was, you know, just reflecting a little bit myself, it was a summer where it was really valuable to be able to sort of come together in community and sort of be present with each other around mm -hmm. sort of, you know, that sort of aftermath of the George Floyd murder. And I think as we were all kind of figuring out, like, how do does our day-to-day -day work as lawyers or as you know clinical students or interns in this space like intersect with like these moments um of like hope for systemic change and like sort of the the um reality like the realities of of violence um so i yeah i think that that i i i, I remember the discussion about qualified immunity because in some ways like it it can be hard as a lawyer to both process the enormity of sort of like the kind of violence inherent in things like the criminal legal system or um, uh, policing in the US and also sort of hold in our heads like what are the doctrinal realities? Like what is qualified immunity and what does it do, right? And like having to hold both of those things at the same time. And I was grateful to have space with the two of you and with all of um, the our, our colleagues to sort of talk about both of those things rather than feeling like we sort of had to talk about one or the other. Um, so that's my moment that I'll share. Um, any other, so I think we're gonna open it up to questions um, from the audience, um, but uh, two more sort of quick questions before we get there. Anything else y'all wanna share about the IFRA experience? Like things you might tell a law student who's interested in applying or things you wish you knew going in? Um, I think I've asked this question to y'all before, so I may know some of the answers, but I'm curious as to, uh, curious as to them nonetheless. Um, yeah, I think that um, for people who are interested in First Amendment, but they're not sure, I think that this is a great program to do. Um, I think that like, I don't know, like there's not that many avenues to exploring First Amendment, like not a lot of law schools have First Amendment clinics, they've started to pop up more. Um, but it can be a kind of hard area, I think, to get into. And I think EFRA um, was like just a very clear like avenue for me. Um, and one uh, that cared about people of color and getting us into the space. Um, and so I just felt like this was a great way to dip my toes into this. Um, and I also wanna say that I think that this is also a great experience because um, clinics are usually like, they're usually better about uh, welcoming students into the space and getting them set up from what I've observed from working like with nonprofits as a legal intern versus clinics. Um, they usually know where you're at and what you've learned and what you may need to work on since they're um, close, like they're in the academic environment. Um, and so I feel like it's just a good experience because they're fully prepared 
to take you on and grow your skills. Like they're so organized. Um, and I just can't recommend clinics enough. Um, so I think that's also like in addition to IFRA being just a good entry space um, into this field, you're also going to a clinic that is prepared for you as well because they know that you're new to this area um, and how to grow your skills. I wanted to add to that. Uh, I think it's a, a great opportunity and a great environment for learning. And that in, and if you're really interested or, or you're maybe thinking about first amendment law, you should consider it. Like it's a great opportunity. It's a great environment for learning. I think that's then one of the top things I am, I always try to look for. Thank you. Thank you both. Um, <laughs> yeah, again, my next ad for clinics, um, but uh, appreciate y'all sharing that. Um, so before we sort of open it up to questions from the audience, I wanted to ask if y'all had any sort of just like reading suggestions or things that you're interested in or following um, that you would recommend to folks interested in um, free expression. Um, uh, we talked about this a little bit, so I, I um, but yeah, very, very much curious about whether there's stuff that you've been reading or thinking about and would recommend to others. You know, I have not been reading. Or y'all are in law school and you don't have time to read things for fun and I should stop asking uh, questions that you can't answer. That's also fair. I have like three books that I'm looking at on my coffee table that I have not read, but I really want to. Um, and I think country, you already know one of these and it's race after technology. Um, I have Edward Snowden's book, um, Permanent Record. Yeah, I have so many that I, I want to read, but I just like haven't gotten to them. And I actually would love to know if you have recommendations that maybe I don't know about. I'm going to come to Huffet, which will give me time to brainstorm. I also admire that we've now fully embodied the clinical spirit where Creek is like, you asked me this question, I'm going to turn it around and ask it to you, which I feel like is a good embodiment of IFRA in practice and also a totally fair question. So Hafet, let's go to you. And then I will, I, in the meantime, I will come up with something because I will be honest and say I haven't been reading shit since the pandemic started, um, but I'll, I'll, I'll do my best to come up with an answer. I think uh, since I've been uh, like more into journalism work, I've been reading this uh, book that is called Journalism Under Fire, Protecting the Future of Investigative Reporting. Um, it, it's great. It's so at some point talk about the uh, slap suits and also it's not that related to freedom of expression, but it's great for writing. It is the point made how to write like the nation's top advocates. It's really great for writing. And if, if someone is interested in reading something in Spanish, I don't know, but it, it has some, uh, a really nice article that explains in Spanish uh, what is freedom of expression related to the digital content. It's called Vida Privada, Reputación y Libertad de Expresión en un Entorno Digital. And it's also, it's, real, it's related from the uh, federal law but in Spanish, so it's, it's, it's great for understanding. Awesome. Um, all right, thank you, uh, Hafet, for A, that excellent answer, and B, giving me time to figure out what I was gonna say. <laughs> um, so I, like I like Corica, I have a bunch of books that I have not read that are sitting uh, sitting there. Um, one book that I did read over the, over the pandemic period that I actually would highly recommend is called Safe Sex. Um, and it's a comic book about the experience, like sort of, of sex workers um, in a dystopian future. Um, so it's by, uh, so it's uh, spelled S F S X, um, and it's by Tina Horn, um, and uh, among other authors. Um, and I think it actually talks a lot about surveillance and like uh, First Amendment expression and um, 
uh, but told through the lens and the experience of sex workers. So that's a book I've really enjoyed that I've read. And then um, the book that I'm like sort of most excited to dig into um, uh, when I at some point have time uh, is Dean Spade, who's a law professor at uh, Seattle uh, University. That's right. Uh, has, thank you, thank you, Corica, um, has a new book called Mutual Aid, um, which is on sort of mutual aid networks and networks of solidarity. Um, and that's something I'm really excited to dig into because I do think that that's been a really important force during the pandemic um, is like mutual aid organizations that are based in sort of communities working to take care of each other. Um, and I don't have a First Amendment angle for it quite yet, but I'm sure I'll find one. Um, so it, it'll probably make an appearance in some way in our IFRA seminar um, next summer, um, but awesome. Um, well, now that uh, my amazing IFRA folks have forced me to answer my own questions, um, it's time for y'all to force us to answer questions. Um, force is a strong word, but um, any questions from any of the audience um, about the program, about folks' experiences, um, about sort of things that you might want to know more about that we already touched on? And you can use the Q&A tool um, uh, if, uh, if you have them. All right, we have one from um, a familiar face, Jazz Jot, who asks a question that I should have included on my initial list, um, but fortunately they're here to here to jump in with it. Um, so what if, like, I think what they, what they ask is sort of, what did you experience as a member of IFRA that's unique? Or I guess like to put it another sort of way, and hopefully I'm um, fair to their um, question, um, what what was what felt unique or different about IFRA as a space from other spaces that you might have been in as a like a law student or been in, um, uh, you know, even in in your in your clinic? Um, I could you both look like you're thinking, so I don't I feel rude calling on y'all. Um, um, I think kind of like what we've already talked about a little bit. Um, when we were really starting to meet, um, once a week was when, um, all of the protests had started. Um, and I feel like, yeah, I was actually, so I actually split my summer. Maybe I shouldn't say this. Okay. But I actually split my summer. You can absolutely say that. It is, it, <laughs> we, it is a thing that you are absolutely allowed to do with IFRA. Yeah. So I split my summer. I did it um, at one place and I did the Samuelson Clinic. Um, but Wait, you could totally I, say where you worked. <laughs> I know, I'm trying not to because I'm about to get to the part that I. Oh, okay, <laughs> got it. But um, we didn't really talk about what happened at, at my first internship, and then my second internship, we did talk about it, and we were talking about it in the IFRA space. Um, and I feel like that's pretty normal is that you just like wouldn't say much about it, just like a couple of words because people don't really know what to say um, and how to support you. Um, and I just felt like Ifra was really supportive with everything that was going on because I felt like it was hard to work, like it was hard to concentrate when you see the world like burning um, down outside your house. Um, and so I just, yeah, it was just, if it's been a super supportive environment, which is not usually what you see from law school spaces. Like, I feel like law is just like, let's take everything out of you. And <laughs> if it was like, let's feed into you, like, let's make sure you're okay. And like, it's okay to not be okay. Um, and so I really appreciated that is just being around like-minded people who cared about um, our well-being. 
I feel like I yeah I feel like uh, if there were emojis it, there would just be I could actually put the emojis I could put just hearts over my head thank you Karika thank you for sharing that um Hafet do you have uh sort of any any thoughts I think uh, as, as Karika said it was a great uh environment that was uh like they you like they it seems like you care a lot about us and I think that's 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 unique about all the things I have worked with, and specifically in the moments we were living in summer. So uh, I think it was a, it was great. I do care about you. I do. Okay. All right. Uh, enough of the waterworks. Um, yes. Thank you. Thank you both. And I think, you know, um, like as I think about sort of Ifra, I do think also. Um, the the way in which and I think actually this brings me to the sort of next question someone asked which is like you know I think the way in which we very much explicitly built the program to be really small um was something that we thought a lot about internally because like often when you're doing sort of programming for of this kind it's like oh how many people can we get in like how big can it be and you know we had always gone in with the vision that IFRA was going to be actually a really small program so we were initially planning on taking four fellows and then y'all were just so impressive that we had to take five um but uh and so I feel really lucky that we were able to create that kind of space where folks felt like sort of individually like, you know, cared for and paid attention to in part, I think, because we were able to sort of have it be a smaller program that wasn't like, oh, gosh, like it's 30 people in a room. And, you know, this is one more, um, you know, especially as things went remote in the spring um, for lots of uh, lots of students like, oh, great, this is one more 30 person Zoom room. Um, uh, you know, uh, Zoom University School of Law. Um, but uh, yeah, so I guess that's my reflection on the question. Um, Becca asked, um, so how do you think some of the special slash unique experiences from IFRA might scale or be incorporated into other teaching um, or working environments slash forums? Um, so I certainly have thoughts on this, but I would love to hear from y'all first about whether there's things that you think that we did that might be, sort of workable in other places in your like law school career or other working environments? I think I, I would like to start with that one. I rem and it was in the, for the clinic work, I, I mentioned before that I have to do this uh, meeting with a client. Like that type of work make me more confident at, pu at public speaking. So I, I am right now, uh, the spokesperson for the, pro bono, for the intellectual property pro bono program in my law school. So, and that like, since that moment, like I start talking more and it makes me more, more confident. I don't know how that worked, but it, it worked. Um, hmm, this is a good question. Um, well, I think about how um, we talked a lot about like professionalism and um, dealing with workplaces, dealing with like workplace issues. And so we would, um, we had a couple of, of weeks where we met and we talked about like different dynamics at work and how to deal with those issues. Um, and you just don't get that in law school. Like no one comes to us and tells us, this is how you deal with this situation. The most you get from law school is like, you don't wanna burn bridges and like that's all they tell you. Um, and so I think law schools could do a better job at um, just like teaching their like law students how to deal with these issues, especially like, because I'm at Cornell, most of our class is younger people who haven't worked before. And so they don't know how to navigate these spaces. And so I think law schools should incorporate this more. Um, I think in terms of the clinic, um, 
Yeah, like Hoffett said, like giving people more opportunities to get comfortable with public speaking. Like I had to speak at meetings and discuss what I was what I was working on, and that helped me grow. Um, and I think that could be something that also could be implemented um, in other clinics or other spaces. Yeah. Yeah, I love I love both of those points. So the point sort of about creating opportunities for students to like really take the lead and try things and or and like speak in public. And yeah, I think Karika, you know, I think I really appreciate your point about sort of like how, you know, there aren't lots of opportunities in law school or often in any kind of sort of in lots of professional spaces to talk realistically about like how do we how do you deal with like moments of uh like where you know someone's being racist in a workplace or like so where someone is behaving inappropriately even though like inevitably like lawyers are going to encounter that right like you know it's like this is actually a reality of practice it's like you're going to encounter um moments where pe people are not behaving appropriately um so thank you for sharing um i I was going to answer, but I love the next question so much, and I'm so curious as to see, to see y'all's answers to this. Um, so uh, Jeff asks and notes that he always feels bad asking this question to actual job interviewees, so we're going to ask y'all instead. Um, uh, in what kinds of settings do you see yourself practicing law in your ideal career, and what's your dream job? And I will note that I think uh, that uh, if anyone wants to offer either Karika or Hafet their dream job after this, like you can absolutely reach out to me and I would be happy to happy to connect you directly. Um, so, uh, but yeah, I'd love to hear about like what, it, yeah, where do you, like, what kinds of work would you love to do? Um, yeah, it's a small question. Um, do you want me to, if you want me to um, vamp for another like 30 seconds while y'all think of answers, I'm ha happy to do that. I think I would like I would like to do clinical work. I think it's really I I have uh, have experiences in government courts um, or some big uh, law firms, but I think clinical has been uh, the best environment for working. Like they have uh, they are respectful they. There, it's it's unique. It's a unique environment. Like I, I think, yeah, I would, I would like clinical, and if it could be related to First Amendment or privacy law, uh, intellectual property that I really uh, enjoyed at, at at my personal time. Uh, but I think, I think, yeah, if, if I could do clinical work at on all those areas, I would be uh, well more than happy. Yeah, my dream job. So obviously I want to do government surveillance and First Amendment work. Um, and I think, I think so I've been doing the, I did the movement lawyering um, practicum this past semester. And basically movement lawyering is about putting power into communities and not thinking that as lawyers, like we have all the answers and we know what communities need, but letting the community um, guide you on, on what they need and you figuring out how to get that. And so my dream job is basically working with communities. It doesn't necessarily look purely legal. Um, I think there's a lot of times the law is not the answer. Um, and so I think for me, I just want to work with communities and figure out how um, to make their lives easier. Like, how can I support them? What do they need um, from us? Um, since um, for better or for worse, people do look at lawyers as um, having like all of the status. And so what can I do with the status that I have um, to help these communities? And so, yeah, my dream job is basically working with communities on government surveillance issues and how 
to prevent that from happening. Um, I don't know what setting that is in. I'm guessing probably like a nonprofit or a clinic space. Um, but yeah, dream job. Amazing. Well, thank you so much to both of you for sharing. Um, so we're nearing the, the end of our time together. Um, so, you know, I'd love, you know, yeah, Hafet, Karika, thank you so much um, for coming and chatting about this and, you know, sharing some of those sort of like your, your personal experiences, your experiences with IFRA, with law school and the law more generally. I'm really grateful for that. Um, I'm wondering if either of you have any sort of last words or last things you want to share given what we've talked about today. And this is like, you don't have to, I'm just asking. Um, yeah, I feel like I, I might just be repeating myself, but I really enjoyed my time with Ephra. Um, I also remember interviewing with Kendra and thinking that, like, that this just ended, like, after the summer, like, it was it, and I would never, like, hear from, from everyone again, and I'm very grateful that that is not the case, and that we're all still connected, um, because I think that's sometimes how internships feel, is, like, it ends, and then that's over, and, like, maybe once a year you check in, but that's not been the case with IFRA, um, but yeah, I've, I really enjoyed my time. I think it's a great way um, to see if, if First Amendment um, is the space that you want to go into. Um, for me, I was just kind of exploring. Um, and I'm very grateful that I figured out that this was an area that I wanted to focus my career on. Corica, I'm so glad you said that because um, yeah, like I do think that's, it's important to emphasize that like y'all are not rid of me um, as I keep telling you. Um, and, you know, I'm really excited actually to get to sort of build uh, connections across between y'all and like the cohort that we're currently recruiting for and will be incoming in the spring. And like, I don't know, even like just imagining hopefully a couple of years from now when there's like many generations of IFRA folks like that are either whether working in First Amendment spaces or not, or like, you know, maybe I feel like it's inevitable that at some point, like an uh, IFRA cohort, IFRA uh, a cohort member is just going to be like, I'm giving up on the law and I'm moving to go for, farm go goats for a living or something. And then we'll, we'll all get to enjoy delicious goat, goats, uh, goat cheese from uh, that IFRA cohort member. But basically, you know, really excited to sort of build those, that community independent of where folks hang up and end up. Um, how did we end up talking about goat cheese? I have no idea. All right, Hafet, please uh, save me from myself. Any, any last words or last thoughts? I think I, I, I'm, I was like testing waters with uh, my first amendment interest and I really liked it. So I, I've been, I'm, I'm, since uh, this summer, I've been working for getting better at, at the wide variety of first amendment issues. So I think if you are considering first amendment, you should consider IFRA. It's, it's just an, an, an top option. Cool. Y'all are, y'all are great. Um, thank you so much. Um, and yeah, thank you to our fantastic uh, ASL interpreters, uh, Shannon and Nora, and to our uh, CART captioner, um, Nancy, um, and to uh, the events team at Berkman Klein who hosted this, uh, Lance, Rubin, and Megan, and of course to Jazjad and Sybil, my, my incredible IFRA colleagues without whom I none of this would be possible to be like entirely fair, Frank. Um, so yeah, thank you so much, everybody. Really appreciate y'all making the time. Um, and thanks for coming to all of our attendees.